As everyone's getting seated, I just wanted to um, let everybody know about the agenda schedule change. So tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., uh, prior to the agency liaison updates, um, ex officio updates, we will um, bring back the child and adult schedules um, and we'll review those um, and we will have motions and we will go ahead and vote um, during that time period. Um, so it may push things back by a few minutes, but we'll try to catch up by reducing the time of the break. Uh, let's readjourn. We're going to go to va uh, Ebola vaccine with an introduction by Dr. Fry. Good afternoon. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the new uh, Ebola uh, virus vaccine work group and uh, what our uh, work has been uh, to date. Here you see the uh, committee members and all the people who are participating in our committee. Uh, I'm happy to say that Beth Bell and Robert Atmar are on the committee, and our committee lead is uh, Mary Choi. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the other people who, um, and also Elizabeth Irvin. I want to thank all the other representatives, consultants, and CDC uh, contributors who are participating in our committee. Uh, they have been uh, very active to date. So by a way of agenda for today, uh, we'll, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Choi information uh, regarding the Ebola virus and the disease that it causes. Uh, Dr. Beth Ann Kohler from Merck will be talking about the Ebola vaccine, uh, including safety, efficacy, and immunogenicity. And again, um, Dr. Choi will be talking about our perspective on the vaccine data and our next work group steps. Our terms of reference are listed here. You can see that we will be reviewing the available data for the recombinant vesicular stomatitis vaccine, uh, which contains the Zaire Ebola virus glycoprotein vaccine in order to inform domestic vaccine policy options for ACIP consideration. Uh, we'll also um, uh, make recommendations for use of the vaccine uh, in pre-exposure vaccination of healthy adults who are at least of 18 years of age and at occupational risk for exposure to Ebola virus species Zaire. We decided to uh, divide our work into two phases. So our activities will include um, the first, during the first phase, will include reviewing the vaccination data for healthy, non-pregnant, non-lactating adults without immunocompromising conditions, and also identify U.S. populations at occupational risk for exposure to the Ebola virus, particularly the Zaire species. And during phase two, then, we will identify areas of further research to inform potential uh, future vaccine recommendations. Thank you. Dr. Choi. Thank you, Dr. Fry, for your presentation. So on August 1st, 2018, the Ministry of Health confirmed an outbreak of Ebola virus disease in North Kivu province, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The virus responsible for the outbreak belongs to the Zaire Ebola virus species. The current outbreak is a 10th EVD outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo and is the largest to ever have taken place there. As of September 29, 2019, cases have been reported in 29 health zones and three provinces. To date, we have over 3,000 reported cases and over 2,000 deaths. In addition, 165 healthcare workers have become infected in the course of this outbreak. 
On the picture on the bottom is an epi curve of the outbreak as of September 29th. Uh, in the red are the confirmed cases, and in the blue are the probable cases. Ebola virus disease is a deadly disease caused by infection with one of the four viruses within the genus, and they're listed here. The natural reservoir for the virus is unknown. However, similar stu studies and similar uh, viruses makes us think that the reservoir is actually uh, fruit bats. For the rest of my presentation, I'm going to focus on Ebola virus, species Zaire Ebola virus. So since 1976, when the virus was first discovered, there have been 28 outbreaks of Ebola virus disease. Ebola virus species Zaire Ebola virus is responsible for 18 or 64% of these outbreaks. This has resulted in over 31,000 cases and over 12,000 deaths. Ebola virus species Zaire Ebola virus is also responsible for the two largest EVD outbreaks the 2014 West Africa outbreak, as well as the current DRC outbreak. Untreated, the mortality rates for this virus infection is between 70 to 90%. And among the four viruses within the genus that cause EVD, it is the highest mortality rate. In persons infected with Ebola virus, the virus can be found in all bodily fluids to include those listed here. Contact with, the, um, contact with the virus occurs through a break in the skin, um, mouth, eyes, or mucous membranes um, with the body fluids of someone who is sick or has died of Ebola. The signs and symptoms of EVD are, are listed here and include fever, headache, muscle pain, abdominal pain, and rash. Bleeding can be seen in Ebola, but in general is seen in less, less than 15% of cases. As you can see, the signs and symptoms of Ebola are very nonspecific. There's nothing pathognomonic on the slide, and that's one of the reasons why EVD is so hard to diagnose. It's also important to know that a person who is infected with the virus is not contagious until symptoms develop. Uh, so this is a graphic depicting the progression of illness and Ebola virus disease. So following the infection, there is an incubation period. Um, this has been quoted to be about 2 to 21 days, but on average is between 8 to 10 days. During this incubation period, the person does not have any symptoms of Ebola and they're not contagious. The first symptoms that we see with, with Ebola are what we call dry symptoms, and they can include fever, muscle ache, fatigue. And during this time, because signs and symptoms of Ebola have appeared, the patient is contagious. On or about day four is when patients usually start developing vomiting and diarrhea. And so we call these wet symptoms. At this point, the patient is very contagious because the vomit, the feces, and all their other bodily fluids are now infected with the virus. Death happens about seven to 10 days after illness onset in people who are not treated. And uh, the concentration of the virus is highest in, uh, in dead bodies. With regards to sequelae, the true incidence of sequelae amongst EVD survivors is really unknown. And part of the reason is that be before the 2014 outbreak in West Africa, the outbreaks were quite small and the number of survivors were small as well. However, there have been a handful of studies that have kind of looked at this issue. And in general, it appears that sequelae vary over time and that most do resolve with time as well. Um, with regards to most commonly reported symptoms, there was one study done um, very early on um, that looked at sequelae at six months, and the most commonly reported um, signs and symptoms are listed here in the order of most common to least common, and that's including arthralgias, myalgias, abdominal pain. Another study was done more recently following the 2014 outbreak, um, and they looked at sequelae at two years. And um, again, in order of, uh, in order of um, most common to least commonly reported, uh, they found uveitis, headache, joint pain, cataracts, and muscle pain. 
There was another study done recently following the survivors of the Guinea uh, outbreak from West Africa and found that within one year of discharge, Ebola survivors actually had a five-fold greater mortality than the general population. The exact reason for this increased mortality was not quite known. Um, they did do some verbal autopsies and that sort of thing, and they were speculating that it may have been due to renal disease as a sequelae of their severe EVD. Uh, and they did find an association with um, the amount of time that people were admitted for Ebola and subsequent mortality at one year. We also know um, from West Africa and from previous studies that Ebola virus persistence does happen in survivors. So we have found Ebola virus in survivors in testes, in the aqueous humor of the eye, in the cerebral spinal fluid of the brain, in the placenta, and then also um, it has been uh, found in breast milk in mothers who have um, survived. With regard to immunity, the duration of natural immunity against Ebola virus survivors is essentially unknown. However, there have been a few studies that looked at this, and some survivors have been shown to have high levels of specific IgG antibodies to the Ebola glycoprotein. And in addition, in addition they were found to have neutralizing activity at 11 to 40 years after recovery. Um, it should be important to note that um, the natural immunity, though, however, is postulated to be species-specific. So the idea is that if you're infected with Zaire Ebola virus, the thought is that you'll be protected potentially from future Zaire Ebola virus infections, but potentially not protected from, let's say, the other um, species like Bundabugio or Typhorus. It's also important to note, I think, for the work that we're going to be doing going forward that the immune correlate for protection in humans against Ebola virus infection is, is unknown and is thought to be a combination of both um, humoral and cell-mediated immunity. With regards to treatment, there is no FDA-approved treatment for EVD at this time. Um, previous studies during West Africa have shown that early supportive care alone can significantly improve chances of survival with mortality rates down to 40%. Um, in November of 2018, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, they conducted a randomized clinical control trial looking at four different experimental therapies. That data was reviewed in March of 2019 and found that two therapeutic agents, Regeneron and MAB114, were found to reduce mortality in all comers uh, to 29 to 34% um, respectively. And in, when you look at a subset of those patients who came in early in care, the mortality dropped even more to about 10%. So uh, to this point, I've been talking mostly about EVD in the international setting. So what is the situation in the United States? So um, 11 individuals have been treated for Ebola virus disease in the United States. They were all associated with the 2014-2016 West Africa outbreak. Of these 11 individuals, seven individuals for seven individuals, the diagnosis EVD was actually made overseas and then they were medically evacuated to the United States for care. For four of the 11 individuals, the diagnosis of the EVD was actually made in the United States. Uh, two out of the 11 died. Of these 11 cases, there was one instance where a, someone who came um, overseas and had EVD diagnosed in the United States they did transmit that virus um, in the United States to two other individuals, who, both of whom were healthcare workers, they were nurses. The 11 EVD patients were treated at five hospitals in the United States. Eight of the 11, their treatment actually was initiated at these special pathogen treatment centers, such as Emory, Nebraska, NIH, and Bellevue. For three individuals, they were initially treated at a community hospital, but then later transferred to one of these special pathogen centers. So in terms of risk and populations at risk in the United States, who would that be? You know, as Dr. Fry mentioned, this is something that our work group will be investigating, but certainly some of these at-risk, potentially at-risk populations include these people listed on the slide here, such as laboratory workers who handle cultures, diagnostic samples, or animals contaminated or infected with replication-competent Ebola virus, healthcare workers at these special pathogen centers, as well as personnel responding to an EVD outbreak. 
So I, when we talk about laboratory workers, I think we can maybe in general divide them into two groups, um, individuals who work in biosafety level four laboratories, as well as individuals who work in LRN laboratories, which I'll discuss next. So there are 10 BSL-4 laboratories in the United States, and they're listed here. And in total, uh, as an estimate, there are about 350 to 400 people that work in these facilities. Um, and within the BSL-4 population, you have individuals who will handle cultures and animals uh, contaminated or infected with replication-competent Ebola virus for research purposes. But then you'll also have individuals who handle diagnostic or clinical sp uh, specimens uh, that, may be, that may contain replication-competent Ebola virus. So the Laboratory Response Network, or LRN, as I mentioned previously, is a network of local, state, federal public health, food testing, veterinary diagnostic, and environmental testing laboratories. They're affiliated uh, oftentimes with federal agencies, military installations, and other state and local partners. At this time, 57 LRN labs have the capacity to test for Ebola virus. And to date, 37 labs have tested clinical samples collected from suspect or confirmed EVD patients. So we talked a little bit earlier on the special pathogen centers. So what are these centers and then how do they fit into the network uh, framework of uh, US preparedness? Um, so in response to the US EVD cases during the 2014 West Africa outbreak, HHS um, developed a nationwide regional treatment network to care for patients with Ebola and other special pathogens. And so what they did was they developed a framework where healthcare facilities were divided into four tiers. So the first tier are frontline healthcare facilities, and there are about 4,800 of these types of facilities. And with regards to Ebola, these facilities have the necessary materials and staff to take care of a suspect or confirmed EVD patient for between 12 to 24 hours. And as you go down the list, you'll see that for e as we go down the tiers, um, the number of facilities in each tier go down, and the amount of time that they're able to care for an Ebola patient goes up. And so the highest tier here are the regional special pathogen centers. Um, so there are 10 regional special pathogen centers in the United States with approximately 500 healthcare workers and support staff. Um, these facilities have specialized high-level isolation units equipped with their infrastructure, the laboratory cap capacity, and staff to care for patients with um, very hazardous um, infections like Ebola. And these special pathogen centers have the ability to treat and simultaneously at least two patients with EVD for the duration of their um, illness. So then the last group of or population that potentially is at occupational risk for EVD are persons responding to EVD outbreaks. Now, the number of organizations, U.S.-based organizations, um, responding to an outbreak is going to vary based on the size of the outbreak and the location. But as an example, um, just U.S. government alone, um, 4,000, over 4,000 responded to the West Africa outbreak. So uh, as you all know, there is a recombinant vesicular somatitis virus-based Ebola vaccine. Um, it is a live vaccine, and it was initially developed by Public Health Agency of Canada, and um, Merck now holds the intellectual rights. As you all probably also know, um, the vaccine is being used currently in the outbreak in DRC, um, but as the outbreak in DRC has evolved, the use of the vaccine has also evolved. So um, in the beginning in August, the initial people, groups that were eligible to receive the vaccine were adults and children greater than the age of one. The dose that they received that they were given was a one ML dose and um, vaccination was given in a ring vaccination strategy and where contacts and contacts of contacts were vaccinated. Uh, over time, uh, based on the dynamics of this outbreak, uh, by June of 2019, the eligibility criteria was expanded to include pregnant women um, after the first trimester, lactating women. Also, the eligibility age for children was actually expanded to six months, and the dose uh, that's used currently is the half ML dose. 
the ring vaccination strategy is still in play, but they've expanded the ring vaccination to actually include a third ring, which I will discuss next. And then, as you may also have heard, in September, uh, DRC approved use of a second different vaccine, the adeno MVA philo, uh, for use as well. So this is a graphic depicting the current ring vaccination strategy that is being used in DRC. In the middle of the slide, you'll see a red stick man. That is a confirmed case. And so it's individuals who are associated with a confirmed case that are being offered vaccination using a three ring strategy. So the first ring is shaded here in dark blue are the contacts. So these are people who had exposure to the confirmed case while they were symptomatic, maybe family members, caregivers. In the second ring is shaded here in light blue are then also the contacts of contacts. So these are individuals who are associated with the contacts of the confirmed case. And so these could potentially be, um, you know, other family members, neighbors, that sort of thing. And then this third ring is, is shaded here in yellow is the new ring. And these are people that are even one step removed from that. And so these are people that potentially li live in the same geographic area. So this is the ring vaccination strategy that they are using in DRC for when there is cases. Um, they are also offering um, pre, you know, pre-exposure vaccination to uh, frontline healthcare workers and response um, uh, workers that are responding to this outbreak. So in summary, um, Ebola virus, species Zaire Ebola virus infection is a severe illness with high morbidity mortality when untreated. Uh, the virus is responsible for 64% of the EVD outbreaks that have been reported since 1976, and that the current outbreak in DRC is the largest and is still ongoing. Um, in terms of populations in the United States are at risk, potential occupational risk for this, um, of exposure to this virus, um, include laboratory personnel, healthcare personnel of these special pathogen centers, as well as persons responding to EVD outbreaks. And that is all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that presentation. Any questions from the committee? Yeah, Do you have one? Go ahead, Lee. Grace. Grace. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm so, I apologize. I always have so many questions. My question is related to, um, I, I'm just curious because uh, the third ring, what prompted um, expansion to the third ring in part because I wouldn't think it would be, you would think the second ring would be sufficient for most types of outbreak control. So what was different in, in this outbreak? Yeah, so um, basically it, it had to do with the security, you know. So a lot of the, um, the di dynamics of this outbreak, um, a lot of the changes um, that people that the response community are making have to do with the security problem in DRC. And so um, there have been areas where um, it is very difficult to vaccinate uh, the, the case. So the, the case is not, um, does not want to be vaccinated or does not want to, the case does not want to cooperate with the response. They have uh, individuals there who, who don't want to cooperate. And so what they have done in these pockets is then ex expanded this, something that they had been doing kind of um, off and on previously, but now they have it, they're doing it a little bit more systematically where if th this group does not want to be vaccinated and uh, so therefore like if the case is not um, cooperating, right? But in, order for, in order for you to find out who the contacts are and the contacts are the contacts, Somebody has to tell you, like the case has to tell you who their contacts are. So in order to delineate that ring, it requires people to, to participate in the response, right? And so what they've done is that when that doesn't happen, a ring does not open, okay? Like a ring cannot open if you don't know who the contacts and the contacts of contacts are. And so uh, doing, opening up this third ring where you can vaccinate people who live in the same geographic area that allows you to vaccinate in that community when there are issues with vaccinating the, 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 the central cluster, gotcha. if I explain So you're saying that. basically, uh, because there's challenges with contract tracing and protection of the second ring, 
the third ring strategy then becomes implemented as another way to offer yeah protection. yeah okay. and then you, you know yeah and this in general i mean when they talk about resistance and community resistance of vaccination you know resistance within the community is not homo is not homogenous is not the same throughout so there are pockets of the community that do want to be vaccinated and by opening up this third ring they have an avenue to do so Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Hunter. Thanks. Um, so uh, unless I w wasn't paying attention, you didn't talk about um, the side effects or adverse effects to the vaccine. Let me, I, let me uh, lay out a little bit and I'll get to my question at the end. <clears throat> and um, you didn't talk much about um, the implementation uh, with healthcare workers in the United States. Um, as far as a couple of real practical questions that, um, so working in local public health, um, I've had the opportunity to interact with lab staff about, um, so for example, exposures to brucella. And you get a, quite a different variety of responses by individual lab people to um, what their personal risk is and how long they're willing to um, you know, take medications for. So I'm anticipating that especially if, uh, depending on what level uh, you go down to in recommendations on your four tiers of hospitals and um, uh, the variety of different responses you're gonna have, as, as a group, we are going to have to um, give guidance in a way as to what are, is your risk? How much of a complications are you gonna have from this? Uh, vaccine, um, so that the people like me <laughs> who are um, advising uh, local health departments and, um, you know, uh, they, the, the, the hospital people are going to be coming to me asking, you know, how, do we really have to vaccinate these people? And these people are giving, giving us a lot of pushback. How can I talk to them in order to get them to get the shots they need, or do they really need it? So uh, if you guys on the work group could really focus, I don't know if you've already focused on those issues, but that's what I need to help me make a decision if I'm still around when we vote on this. Yes, thank you for that comment. Um, Sharon, do you wanna respond? Yes, yeah. I was just gonna say we have, uh, we've only met a couple times and we haven't obviously gotten through uh, all the discussion points. Uh, that topic of, uh, at that level, um, let me just say we're not there yet. Uh, we will be talking about the risk groups in more detail than we have and what and, and how to manage, how we think they should be managed. Dr. Bernstein. I, I was just interested in the, um, so I assume you don't isolate or can't isolate the contacts of the contacts of the contacts and they're not contagious until they manifest dry symptoms. Once somebody manifests dry symptoms, how do you remove them from the other contacts in order, since they become increasingly contagious and their symptoms move quickly, at least according to that one graph that you uh, showed us? Sure. So um, in an outbreak, what happens is that you have your confirmed case and then you get a list of their contacts. Now, these are people who are who was who were exposed to the patient while they were symptomatic. And you do ask questions to kind of try to delineate that time frame. And then we have teams that then follow each of these contacts every single day for 21 days after their last exposure to the um, to the case, and so by by doing this, by checking on them every day, and you use a standardized checklist of all the symptoms, you are able to find them the minute they develop symptoms. Okay, so normally they're given a telephone number, also potentially to call if they develop symptoms. You know, after you saw them, but. That is the purpose of contact tracing. And so the, these teams will follow each contact every single day. And the minute they develop any sort of symptoms, a, an alert is raised and a special team will come out and take the patient from the community to a designated facility. And that's when they will then be tested. Dr. Messonnier. 
Yeah, thank you, Mary. And I, I just want to comment that this, this is an exceedingly complicated outbreak with lots of logistic challenges and working in a conflict zone. And I, as interested public health professionals, I know many of you have questions that you would love to ask our experts at the break. But the issue at hand is that there is some urgency around the first question that was posed, which is this question of the um, um, people in the United States who are going to be responding to the outbreak, going to be working with specimens, and potentially going to be taking care of people who are ill. And so we've asked the working group and are going to ask you to try to come to a rapid resolution around that relatively narrow issue because, you know, we anticipate that we may very rapidly have a licensed vaccine for which we want to be equipped to move quickly on a recommendation because there are people that are at risk. And so I would ask you to try to let us, you know, to try to stay a little focused on that first issue because it does feel like there's going to be a lot of pressure to try to get through all the data of the working group to try to come to some resolution quickly. Dr. Hunter. So I think if you focus on that particular issue, then the question becomes, you know, who's in, who's out? Who, who is the person that really is going to have risk? You know, is it the, um, the um, MPH student who's just going to be doing data in the uh, large city in that area, that, but it's not going to be working at a tr Ebola treatment unit, uh, versus the uh, Medicine Sans Frontier uh, doctor who's going to be there for six months? So that's what I, yeah, what I need. Yeah, no, those are excellent points. And it's something that our work group will be working through and talking about, you know, we talked about, I mean, I said in general what these groups are, certainly persons that are responding to an outbreak that is also not homogenous population, as you mentioned, you know, CDC has been responding to Ebola outbreaks since 1976. We have not had anyone get infected, you know, um, but the 11 uh, individuals who were affected during West Africa, many of those were healthcare workers. So um, again, risk is not uniform and that'll be part of the work of our work group. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Dr. Salaji. Just a quick question. Has there been anybody through travel in either the dry symptoms or early and wet symptoms who then infected somebody, whether in the United States or some, some other country, because could that be another at-risk population? Question, if I understood the question correctly, is, is case, there anyone who had a dry... A case who was traveling. Right, who had, was in a dry phase and transmitted the disease right. during that time. Am I correct in... in, in that? So I think that gets back to contact tracing, uh, although the time frame for um, the disease process is quite narrow and people die very quickly. Uh, so we, there are mechanisms to do that, although not all perfect, uh, but that would be involved in contact tracing and people would have to um, move quickly to, to accomplish that. Any other questions or comments? I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Dr. Mr. McNally. Go ahead. In your slide that notes vaccination strategy, Eastern DRC EVD outbreak, you note that there is a second vaccine that's approved for use in the DRC. And I'm just wondering if you can uh, just talk about the difference between the vaccines and perhaps the reason for the development of the second one. Yeah. Um, so the second vaccine is what I colloqu I guess we colloquially call here at CDC the J and J vaccine. It's a it's a it's a it's a prime boost vaccine. So the Merck vaccine, which Dr. Collar will talk about next, is a single dose uh, vaccine. Uh, the J and J vaccine, which is the one that's the adeno and then MVA philo boost, is a prime boost uh, vaccine. And that prime and boost, um, the time between that is zero and fifty six days. Um, so that's one of the differences. Um, that vaccine also does protect against Zaire Ebola virus species. Uh, because of the way that the, of the, the philo, the MVA philo boost, there was some theoretical thoughts that maybe it could, you know, protect against other species, but that is still needs to be evaluated uh, to, at this point, but there's been no animal data that's been published that shows that it cross protects against the other uh, species of Ebola virus. Um, 
there have been, um, you know, obviously they, uh, some studies on the safety and immunogenicity uh, of that, of, of that vaccine that are ongoing. And then the idea in the DRC is to use it in a area that is not yet um, affected um, by the outbreak, but is within a zone of, uh, at risk. Can I just Dr. ask you for, yeah, can I ask you for clarification about some a language that was used? Um, are either of these vaccines used, are, are they licensed? Because I think- Licensed? Right. No. So no. the vaccines are being used in DRC under what mechanism? Yeah, under a compassionate use. Both vaccines are going to be used under compassionate use. There are no licensed vaccines that are being um, for, for, for Ebola virus. This I is apologize the first one. for misspeaking. Thank you. Dr. Fry. I uh, would just add to that that the VSV vaccine, vectored vaccine, is much further along in its investigations and data collection than the, uh, the adenovirus vaccine. And so that's why we're focusing uh, on the uh, uh, VSC vaccine at this moment. Are there any further comments or questions? Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. We will now move on to safety and immunogenicity of the RVSV Delta G ZEBOV GP vaccine by Dr. Kohler. Yes, it, it is a bit of a mouthful. So <laughs> thank you so much to the working group and to the ACIP for the opportunity to be here and to speak to you all today about the, um, the vaccine that we refer to as V920. That's a little bit easier to, to um, say. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on background to fill you in a little bit more on, on what is this vaccine, a little bit of the non-clinical data, and then really dive into the clinical data that we have to support the use of this vaccine. So as, as Dr. Choi mentioned, this vaccine was initially developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And uh, in the context of the 2014 West Africa Ebola outbreak, uh, a number of, of uh, institutions, both private and public, became involved in the development and actually contributed in major and really significant ways to the evaluation of this vaccine, including our colleagues here at CDC, the NIH, World Health Organization, Medicine Sans Frontieres, as well as many other groups. And we were really proud to be a part and to join that collaborative um, development program in, in the fall of 2014. So what is the V920 vaccine construct? It is based on uh, recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus, as Dr. Choi indicated. And in fact, the surface glycoprotein of VSV has been deleted and replaced by the surface glycoprotein of Zaire Ebola virus. So the surface of this protein of this virus looks like um, Ebola, but all of the interior proteins are all VSV. It is administered, as Dr. Choi indicated, as a 1 ml dose by the intramuscular route. Now, unfortunately, because the development was done in the context of an outbreak with a great sense of urgency, there wasn't time, as we would typically take, to develop a thermostable type formulation. So this vaccine has to be stored frozen between minus 60 and minus 80 degrees. However, we have generated data to support the fact that the vaccine can be stored at two weeks uh, at two to eight degrees and can be transported, in fact, at two to eight degrees because we recognize that uh, the, it introduces some complications in terms of, of cold chain. However, once it is thawed, it cannot be refrozen. So there were a number of preclinical studies conducted to support licensure. In fact, the Public Health Agency of Canada had done really groundbreaking work prior to the outbreak to demonstrate that the vaccine had a high potential for efficacy in non-human primate studies. And that really positioned the vaccine to be ready to go into phase one clinical trials in the fall of 2014. However, in parallel to the clinical development, uh, we have contributed to the, the preclinical safety and uh, immunogenicity and efficacy database um, to support and to better understand how this vaccine works. So in fact, in terms of pharmacology, we have both immunogenicity and efficacy evaluations going down as low as 300 platforming units, and I'll show you some of those data. We've conducted repeat dose toxicity studies in both mice and non-human primates, biodistribution studies in non-human primates, and developmental and reproductive toxicity studies in rats. 
In addition, because this is a genetically modified organism based on a vesicular stomatitis virus backbone, we have done a detailed environmental risk assessment that includes looking at the ability of this virus to replicate in insect cell cultures and live insects, and looked at potential for transmission um, and infectivity in swine. So here are the results, uh, quickly just an overview of the results of two of the non-human primate studies that were done to look at both immunogenicity and efficacy of this uh, uh, vaccine in the context of um, uh, synomologous macaque challenge model. These studies were both done by our, co our collaborators at USAMRED. Uh, the top um, portion of the slides shows the results of a first study that was done actually just in advance or in parallel with some of the phase one studies. And we looked at the same dose range that you will see in the, the very first phase one studies, a dose range ranging from three times 10 to the six to one times 10 to the eighth PFU. And what you can see is that we had 100% survival in the two highest dose, dose levels, and one animal that succumbed to EVD in the lowest um, dose range there, the three times 10 to the sixth. In a follow-on study where we really wanted to better understand correlates of protection, as Dr. Choi indicated, uh, correlates of protection for EVD are not understood and for this vaccine neither. And so we tried to do a dose de-escalation to try to better understand, actually looking for breakthrough in order to better understand correlates of protection. And happily in one way and, and unhappily in another, in fact, we had 100% survival all the way down to 300 PFU. So the vaccine appears to be highly efficacious, even down at low doses in non-human primates. Um, however, we, it, it has not been terribly helpful in informing correlates of protection. So in parallel to, to preclinical work, a, a huge amount of clinical evaluation was launched. Clinical trials um, were launched in 10 different countries across three different continents, including five countries in Africa, including the three countries that were involved in the outbreak. So Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia were all included in phase two or phase three clinical trials in the context of the outbreak. This slide is, is very busy, but I just wanted to make a couple of points. Um, in fact, there were 13 clinical trials conducted in the context of the outbreak. Eight phase ones where nearly 800 adult subjects and 40 pediatric subjects received V920, and then five phase two or three clinical trials. And this all happened very rapidly. I think everybody remembers the situation in 2014, early 2015. So, the eight phase one trial started in the fall of 2014. By January of 2015, a decision was made on the dose to take into the phase two, three trials, and those are shown on the bottom. So a large number of doses were looked at in phase one, as you can see on the right-hand side. And by January, a decision was made to take two times 10 to the seventh forward into phase two, three trials. The PREVAIL study sponsored by the NIH and conducted in collaboration with the Liberian government um, started in February of 2015. Ebola Sasufi trial in Guinea started in March. And the STRIVE trial conducted and sponsored by the CDC started in April. So things happened very, very quickly and moved very quickly forward. In total, more than 15,000 people were vaccinated with doses of greater than or equal to two times 10 to the seventh through these trials. So I do want to send, spend just a minute, and I'll go quickly on this because Dr. Choi already introduced the idea of ring vaccination. But the Ebola Sasufi trial in Guinea um, was actually the combination of a public health intervention, uh, ring vaccination that was used to help eradicate smallpox, and a randomized controlled trial. And so they identified these rings, the contacts, contacts of contacts of an index case, and then cluster randomized those individuals, those rings, into immediate or delayed vaccination 21 days later. And in fact, it was this trial that was actually able to generate cases and to um, assess the efficacy of the vaccine. So the ring vaccination trial uh, final efficacy results were published in, in early 2017. Uh, the point estimate of vaccine efficacy was 100% with 95% confidence interval ranging from 63.5 to 100% to with a p-value of 0 0.0471. Um, and that primary analysis represents the results from all vaccinated in the immediate arm 
versus all people who were eligible and consented on day zero in the delayed arm. The WHO also conducted a number of other different kinds of analyses, and I would say that all of the analyses were consistent with evidence of efficacy. So in that analysis, in fact, there were zero cases of EVD from 10, day, 10 days post-vaccination in the immediate arm, and the delayed arm had 10 cases in four clusters. The 10 days post-vaccination is important because it wasn't clear exactly what time point to use to define the start of your efficacy assessment. So the WHO looked at um, the typical time taken for the incubation period. As Dr. Choi indicated, it's typically captured as 2 to 21 days. But by day 10, the majority of people who will present with EVD have already presented. So that was part of it. The other equation was really time for a, a vaccine to induce an immune response and to actually have an effect. So day 10 was defined as the time point to assess efficacy. And importantly, there were actually no cases of EVD occurring in any subjects, whether they were in the immediate group, the delayed group, or actually later on in the trial in the non-randomized group from day 10 post-vaccination post onward. So a little bit about immunogenicity. Um, immunogenicity was not actually assessed in the Ebola Sasufi trial. They did not uh, they were not able to collect blood samples, so there's no direct link between immunogenicity and efficacy. However, the other trials that were conducted in West Africa, um, including a study in Liberia, a study in Guinea, and a study in Sierra Leone, as well as the study that was uh, sponsored by Merck and conducted in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, um, all looked at immunogenicity. And this shows the results actually across, across those studies. Shown in orange is the overall responses. Shown in gray are the results from Liberia. Shown in, in the teal color are the results from um, Sierra Leone. And shown in blue are the, are the data from um, uh, US, EU, and Canada. And finally, in the maroon are the results from Guinea. And what I would like to just point out in this fairly busy slide, if you look at on the top left is day one. Compared to day 28, you can see a clear immune response. These are validated GP ELISA, geometric mean titers. You can see a robust response across all the studies. That those responses are maintained out to day 180, a slight decline, but they are maintained and out to month 12 as well. I will point out that the blue bar, which is the, the results from the US, um, Canada, and Europe, tends to be higher than the, other, the results from the other studies. And in fact, we believe that that is primarily attributable to the fact that, in fact, the samples that came from those three epidemic countries had to be gamma irradiated before they could be tested in a BSL-2 laboratory in the US. We did studies and showed that gamma irradiation results in about a 20% drop in the titers in those samples. So in fact, what you're seeing is about 20% lower in most of those studies. So we believe that this, this effect is primarily linked to the gamma irradiation of those samples. If you look at response rates, again, and this is GP ELISA results, we see similar data using other assays. But uh, zero response rates are, in fact, quite high across all of the studies um, and, again, are maintained out to month 12. Last little bit about durability of the immune response, because we know that, of course, this is an important topic. And it's something that was lacking in the efficacy trial, because the Ebola Sasufi trial only looked out to day 84. And after that, there were no more Ebola cases. Um, so it's very, very important, we believe, to look at the durability of the immune response. As shown here are the results from uh, the study in the US, Canada, and Europe. And you can see that out to two years, which is the longest data that we currently have in validated assays, that you do have good durability. There is a slight decline over time, but, but good durability of immune responses. So in terms of overall safety conclusions, so coming back to the question about safety. So we believe that the safety data in healthy non-pregnant adults does suggest an acceptable safety profile that in the context of demonstrated efficacy supports a positive benefit risk ratio. V920 is generally well tolerated in healthy non-pregnant subjects 18 years of age and older. And that is the indication that we will be seeking is for that age group. 
There have been very few vaccine-related serious adverse events reported to date. And I will add that um, that includes um, the efforts from the DRC that Dr. Choi referred to and where more than 230,000 people have, have received the vaccine under compassionate use. Injection site reactions are very common. Uh, they are generally mild to moderate in intensity and of short duration. Systemic AEs that are reported more commonly um, than placebo recipients include a, a fairly good laundry list here. Um, headache, pyrexia, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, arthritis, chills, sweats, nausea, abdominal pain, and rash. This is a live virus vaccine. It replicates. The m joint events are the, um, uh, the events that have, I, I think, received the most attention based on the data that came from a phase one study conducted in Geneva. The majority of joint events were mild to moderate in intensity and resolved in days for arthralgia, which was very common, um, and for weeks um, for the arthritis. The arthritis was much less common. Generally, less than 5% of subjects developed arthritis. However, in the Geneva trial, it was 24% of subjects that developed arthritis. Um, most of those have been of a relatively short duration, um, but there have been some reports of prolonged duration, things like trigger finger out to two years. Skin and mucosal related AEs, including rash with and without vesicles have also been reported, as well as mouth ulcers. And recall that this is based on a vesicular stomatitis virus for which um, ulcers and, and um, uh, vesicles are a typical presentation. They have been observed in V920 recipients, again, generally less than 5% of subjects. They are generally mild to moderate in intensity and of short duration. These are, again, this is a live virus vaccine, so virus shedding. Um, we are looking for virus shedding. It is not very frequent in adults. Viremia is very frequent, so subjects develop viremia, but um, virus shedding is not very frequent in adults. Data from one phase one study in Gabon suggests that it is more frequent in children, and that's something that we're actively looking at now in a larger study being conducted in West Africa. Secondary transmission has not yet been evaluated, but we are actually hoping that um, a study that will start in Gabon in the near future will actually look at transmission. As I've already mentioned, there are additional studies going on in children a large study in West Africa and, and um, a study in HIV positive adults and adolescents um, is also ongoing in Canada and in a couple of countries in Africa. But data from those studies are not, are not yet available. In addition, a large number of children have been vaccinated through the DRC Compassionate Use uh, Campaign. Uh, and so far, we think we haven't had any major safety signals from anything, but, but the data really are not available. Like children, data from pregnant women is, is limited, and uh, for now we cannot say that the, the safety of the vaccine has been established in pregnant women. So just in terms of regulatory strategy, we are pursuing licensure of this vaccine. It's not yet licensed, um, but we are pursuing licensure of this vaccine in the U.S. Um, it is, is currently under review with the, with the FDA um, with a... Um, a decision time frame for March, although we anticipate perhaps an earlier decision. It's also under review in the EU, and in fact, just on Friday, we had a positive opinion issued by the CHMP, and we expect the Euro European Commission to make a, a, a final decision on that in the near future. It's also under review by 14 at-risk African countries and the WHO pre-qualification group. So typically, these things are done in series. In this case, we've been working with all of these organizations to have them happen in parallel. Um, so the uh, European Medicines Agency has been collaborating with the WHO pre-qualification group and the 14 African countries to do a parallel collaborative review. The indication that we are seeking is based on the efficacy data from the WHO's ring vaccination trial. So it is quite a focused indication that we are seeking adults greater than or equal to 18 years of age in reactive use settings. So this at-risk sort of population is, is the indication that we are seeking. Ultimately, we hope to seek um, supplementary indications based on immunobridging, trying to establish a correlative protection, and then to look at immunogenicity in children, in HIV-positive adults and adolescents, 
and to think about durability of, of the immuno, immune response and how that might translate into durability of protection and to think about general use prophylaxis. I've already highlighted that uh, access to V920 prior to licensure is um, being accomplished under primarily a compassionate use or expanded access clinical protocols, um, including the one that's ongoing in the, in the DRC. There also are some emergency decrees and authorization um, for some countries that allow vaccination of healthcare workers, Medicine Sans Frontier, for example, personnel prior to deployment. And actually within the US, there is an ongoing clinical trial that's being sponsored by the NIH for at-risk personnel at occupational risk of, of exposure to Ebola, called the PREPARE trial. So this slide just summarizes what Dr. Troyer already mentioned, the fact that the vaccine is being used in, um, in the DRC in the North Kivu outbreak, and I've already mentioned that more than 230,000 people have uh, received the vaccine. Just wanted to highlight that in April, uh, the WHO conducted an interim sort of analysis of, um, of efficacy and effectiveness in the DRC, looking at the data to date, and um, th those data are consistent with the data from the Ebola Sasufi trial, um, suggesting a high level of efficacy for the vaccine. So in summary, to finish up, um, we believe that there's a strong preclinical package that existed before the outbreak, and we have complemented that, that package to support um, the safety, efficacy, and immunogenicity of the vaccine. We've worked with a large number of partners, including um, our partners on the STRIVE trial at the, at the CDC, to advance this product through phase one, two, and three clinical trials, including more than 16,000 subjects. It was demonstrated to be highly efficacious in a randomized controlled ring vaccination trial conducted in Guinea, sponsored by the WHO. We believe the clinical trial results demonstrate immunogenicity and safety. And as I've already highlighted, uh, marketing authorization applications are currently under review. And in the meantime, we have committed to work very closely with the WHO, with regulators, with partners in, in, uh, in people who are being deployed to try to support um, for people who want access to the vaccine to um, try to find ways to give them access prior to licensure. So thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you very much questions. for that excellent presentation. Um, I will uh, it, take personal privilege of the chair and ask the first question, if I may, Dr. Fry, and then you. Um, I actually have three questions for you. Um, so first off, once thawed, um, how long is the virus stable at room temperature? Second of all, were you able to parse your immunogenicity data, um, and I, I, I suppose that data was in part derived by compassionate use, and if it was in compassionate use in children, do you have immunogenicity data in children? And lastly, um, under your regulatory strategy, um, you want to obtain supplemental indication for use in children, and, and could you tell me how low an age are you going to go down to, as low as the six months that's being used under compassionate use? So sure, I'll, I'll try to remember those. So first of all, the, the, the thawing, so uh, we have data to support holding the vaccine at two to eight degrees for two weeks after thawing. Um, second question in terms of immunogenicity. Um, so in fact, uh, we have limited immunogenicity data from children that came from the phase one trial in Gabon. Um, there is a large trial, the PREVAC trial, that's sponsored by the NIH in CIRM in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that's ongoing in West Africa, uh, where approximately 1,400 children have been enrolled to receive either the Merck vaccine or the, the, the John, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, in fact. Um, and we'll be looking at immunogenicity. All the samples are being collected there. And it's those kind of data that we would look at to support a supplemental indication ultimately for children. That is the, the pivotal study to support that ultimately. Um, and then the last question. Your supplemental li uh, application for licensure down it, for use in children, it would be as low as six months? It, it's, one, it's one year, actually. Okay. So the pre-vac study goes down to one year. Okay. Dr. Fry. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, nice presentation. Really appreciate it. 
Uh, I have multiple questions, but I'm only going to ask one because I know other people are dying to ask questions and we can always circle back. So I'm interested in your path to licensure as far as timing. Uh, you mentioned March, but um, I was wondering how realistic is that? Have you actually talked to the FDA in, in what types of terms and uh, what type of licensure are you seeking? Thank you. Sure, sure. So yes, we are in active discussions with the FDA. We, they, we submitted the dossier. Uh, it was actually a rolling submission that started last year. So they have been receiving um, pieces of the dossier since October of last year. We've submitted the final piece in July. So that started the review clock. We have um, a um, priority review. They've granted us priority review. So the March date is the PDUFA date based on that priority review. However, um, I, I, it's my understanding that they are doing everything in their power to try to make a decision sooner rather than later. But um, it's still an active, we are actively going back and forth and answering questions as they review the dossier. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado. Um, I have two brief questions. One is around the number of children that have already been studied and the ages. It looks like you've gone down as low as six months, but I just wonder how many to date. Um, and then the second question has to do with the um, efficacy, but I'll come back to that after you. Okay. Um, so numbers of children. So the numbers of, of children, the data that are in the dossier that are under review are very limited, 234. Mm -hmm. That's what was included in the Ebola Sassoufi trial as well as the Gabon phase one trial. Um, the PREVAC trial, as I mentioned, will, will provide significantly larger numbers of data from children. Uh, those data we don't expect to be available for another couple of years. Um, so so that, that will be coming later. Now in the DRC, um, it's actually very large numbers of children who have, been, who have been vaccinated. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but it's tens of thousands of children that have been vaccinated. Um, those data we will be providing to the regulators when they become available to us. As you can imagine, the WHO, it's in the middle of an outbreak and we anticipate it will be some years before those data will be finalized and we can do a clinical study report. Okay. So the second question has to do with slide 19 around the WHO preliminary assessment of efficacy. And um, I, I assume, but I just wanted to confirm with you that the um, number of uh, cases and deaths, um, do you have any, re do you suspect do you have a, re a hypothesis as to why they're so high, as high, higher than what you would predict from your animal models in your other trials, or is this because you suspect that there may be ongoing incubation when these people were vaccinated? Right. So, so I think I mean it's still a very high level of efficacy that they are estimating. It, it does appear that the vaccine has a very high level of efficacy. I mean, it's hard to go against 100%. Um, that's a very high bar, which is essentially what we see in the animals and what was seen in Ebola sasufi. Um, we think those numbers were relatively small. This is probably a, a better assessment. But um, everything that we're hearing is that the vaccine is still very highly efficacious. Dr. Massonier. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Collar. It was a very comprehensive presentation. And I want to just extend my compliments to Merck. It's been an incredible journey um, of rapidity to get from where you were a few years ago to a vaccine that now is with FDA for licensure. So compliments for the fortitude to continue on this path. Um, you know, the issue at hand for ACIP consideration, while there's many fascinating things that we could delve into, is the um, first recommendation consideration, which is the um, idea that Dr. Choi presented, the first thing that we're going to confront you with is this question about um, people in the U.S. who are at risk, either because of travel or because of their work. And so in that setting, I want to ask you maybe to talk a little bit about the supply issues and whether or not there are any concerns given what's going on globally and the fact that so many countries are now considering this vaccine. If there will be any supply concerns if the ACIP were to make such a recommendation this year. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So uh, we anticipate that this vaccine will actually be a stockpile vaccine that um, will be stockpiled by BARDA. And I know that there's BARDA representation here in the room. Um, we have worked very closely with BARDA. BARDA has been an amazing partner and funder for this work. Um, and we anticipate that BARDA will be purchasing doses, licensed doses, 
Um, BARDA has also supported the production of large numbers of investigational doses and in, that is supporting outbreak response. So um, can you just clarify what you mean by stockpiling? Because I, I don't know that folks in this room are as familiar with the BARDA stockpile as opposed to the childhood vaccine stockpile. Right. So, I, and I'm perhaps not the expert to talk about that. Um, so I think the idea is that this would go into the strategic national stockpile um, and would be available for U.S. personnel who are de deemed at risk and who ACIP may recommend receive the vaccine, but it would be administered. We, Our vision, and uh, if I understand correctly, it's the vision of the U.S. government as well, is that this not be a vaccine that we are selling to individual doctors, offices, healthcare providers, um, state departments of health, but that it would be provisioned to the U.S. government and, and then um, given out by the U.S. government. And there, we do anticipate that there will be another stockpile, which will be more the global stockpile, that will be um, purchased by UNICEF and Gavi. Uh, so Gavi, the funder, UNICEF, the purchaser, and, and governed through the WHO. Uh, Dr. Ornstein. Uh, you had an, uh, looking at the immunogenicity data, you mentioned the difference between the 10 to the 8th versus a 10 to the 7th, and you had an explanation for why it was lower, uh, uh, the gamma, whatever you said. But uh, <laughs> I can clarify that if you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Um, but I was wondering, so have you settled on one or the other? Is it the 10 to the 7th or is it 10 to the 8th or it doesn't really matter? Yes. Yeah, so, so in fact, it wasn't linked to the dose. So, so the, when I was comparing across those different, those different bars, those were all the two times 10 to the seventh dose, if you will. Um, and, and so it was really samples from Africa versus samples from the U.S., Canada, and, um, and Europe. Um, that's where the difference was because of gamma irradiation, because the samples from West Africa had to be gamma irradiated. There were data on those slides for the one times 10 to the eighth dose that was only tested in the, in the um, trial in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Um, and in, essentially, we don't see any dose response at, at those dose levels. And in fact, the specifications for the vaccine that will be released are going to be between those two doses, the highest dose, to, dose tested and the lowest dose that showed efficacy. That will be the, the specifications for the vaccine. So they're both included. You're welcome. Dr. Hunter. So if I remember correctly, you said that there are somewhere around 24% of people who end up with uh, some amount of arthritis after this. In, in one trial, it was 24%. In all the other trials, it was 5% or less, but it, it, it does occur. So my question was, um, could any of that been due to actually some of those people having had Ebola itself? So, n no, I, I don't think so. So, okay. so um, because almost all of those cases were actually in developed countries, there was almost no arthritis seen in, in the African countries. What I will say, and I, I didn't include that um, in, in when I described it, but we actually did a post hoc analysis looking for risk factors, trying to understand. Um, and in fact, um, being female or having a history of uh, damage to the joints. Um, was uh, associated with a two to three fold increased risk of developing arthritis after you receive the vaccine. Um, so, you know, we think that, that those kind of risk factors may exist. Um, I will say the Geneva trial, we don't really understand why the rates were so much higher in the Geneva trial. They did use different, uh, different uh, definitions of arthritis. They used imaging, which was not typically done in other studies. Um, but we don't really understand you know, the, the basis for the difference. Thank you. Dr. Admar. Thank you. Um, I have a two-part question. Uh, the, the first um, relates to the de detection of a virus in people who've been vaccinated um, and distinguishing detection by PCR, mm. which may or may not be viable, um, versus by uh, culture. And then the follow-up um, on that is in terms of some of the transmission uh, mm -hmm. studies you have planned, in particular since it, uh, this is initially going to be indicated for healthy adults, um, are there any plans to look at uh, transmission to sexual partners? 
Yes. Uh, so thank you for those questions. So in fact, all of the viremia and uh, shedding assessments that have been done have been done based on PCR. So there are no data available essentially for live virus, for looking for live virus. Um, partly that's link, uh, limited by the sampling. So often the samples are collected and put immediately into Trizol, uh, which then eliminates the ability to actually detect live virus, but it, nobody has actually looked for live virus. I, I guess I had thought that I'd read that there were a case or two, maybe from a skin biopsy or uh, aspirate where, where there has been viral so, virus um, So there was virus detected. I will go back and double check, but I'm pretty sure that even that was by PCR. So we, we validated the PCR assay to be uh, acceptable for synovial fluid and things like that. So we talk about it. When we talk about it, we talk about detecting the virus, but to be precise, it's detecting viral RNA. Um, and sorry, I've forgotten the second. Transmission, particularly to uh, sexual partners. Yes. Um, so um, transmission to sexual partners. We have not looked specifically at whether um, there's virus present in, in semen, for example. We have not looked. In the non-human primate biodistribution study um, that we did, the only places where virus was detected out past day one were lymphoid organs. Um, and it's not, we're not sure if that was really, again, vi live virus or if it was sort of residual stuff that had been, you know, phagocytized or whatever. Um, and we're still in the lymphoid organs. So it's a little bit hard to interpret, um, but we actually don't have data on, on um, the possibility for sexual transmission. It's a great question. Dr. Fry. Sorry, I still have a few more questions. I'll, I'll only ask two and then you can. Um, I just wanna clarify that the shedding was detected from the mouth or exactly where? And also the, vir uh, the shedding or the PCR positivity uh, was noted in uh, at least one vesicle or two vesicles. I mean, how, uh, how many times did you look for it and how many times was it positive? So the first question, um, what, where we looked for shedding was in saliva or, or oral fluids um, and urine. And it was detected more frequently in saliva, as I recall, compared to urine. Um, but again, in, in adults, it's not frequent. Um, in, in either of those body fluids, in children, it was much more frequent. And um, then when we looked in, in vesicles, it was a relatively small number that were, that were tested. I can tell you that in the Merck-sponsored phase three trial, um, skin and joint items were specifically solicited events in that trial. We were aware of the, the results from the Geneva trial. They were solicited, they were referred to a dermatologist or to a rheumatologist for sampling. And so um, there was a fairly significant workups done. The numbers of, of subjects who actually had vesicles wasn't, wasn't a huge number, and it was a small number that were positive. But I think it, it indicated to us that, you know, the fact that you're detecting it in even a small number suggests that it's probably virally mediated when it occurs. Dr. Hunter. But the clinical and epidemiologic characteristics of the transmission of the um, vaccine virus would be related to um, the stomatitis virus not related to how Ebola virus gets transmitted, correctly? Correct? Well, so actually I, I think, you know, we expected the tropism of the virus to actually be dictated by the surface glycoprotein, which should be Ebola. Um, however, we do see these vesicles, for example, and it does suggest to us that in fact what you're seeing is the profile of the vaccine is somewhere a hybrid between the two viruses that make it up. Uh, Dr. Fry. Sorry, I, these are my last two that I know of. <laughs> I'm getting as bad as Grace now. <laughs> um, I have a question uh, about CMI, cell mediated immunity. Uh, I was wondering what kind of studies you might have done regarding CD4, CD8 cells, and also have you looked at innate immunity? And then my last question. Uh, is nutrition. So in some parts of the world, particularly in DRC, in the war-torn war areas, 
Uh, I'm sure the nutrition is not as good as it should be. And uh, does that play a role? It seems like the response to, uh, the antibody response to the vaccine is quite good and may not affect um, antibody response to, enough to make an a, a impact on immunity. I was just wondering, or, or efficacy, I should say. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, so maybe I'll take that one first just to say uh, that we don't have any data on on the effect, potential effect of nutrition. I will say, you know, the immune responses that we did detect in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, as I highlighted, were actually pretty robust. Um, with a 20% uh, probably hit that they took for the gamma radiation, otherwise they look pretty good. That's all, that, I think that's all I can say. In terms of CMI, um, there was early work done um, by folks at the Public Health Agency of Canada and others that suggests that there's not a huge impact uh, of this vaccine inducing CMI. So we don't seem to have a very robust CMI response. We therefore believe um, that the vaccine is primarily driven through antibodies. Uh, CD4 depletion studies, however, suggest that depleting CD4 can impact, as you would expect, with an antibody-driven response. Um, innate immunity, there are data from non-human primates. The group um, at the NIH Rocky Mountain Lab have done studies that suggest that perhaps the early protection with the vaccine um, may be linked to induction of innate immunity because, in fact, we seem to have protection before we even have really robust detectable immune responses. Dr. Hunter. I hope this is my last question, too. Um, if, if I understood you correctly, you said there's not much cell-mediated cell immunity or, say, memory. So does that mean the next time there's an outbreak and we're going to have to revaccinate these folks that are going out to the next response? So CMI, to me, CMI is, is perhaps separate from, I guess I think of that as CD8, for example, primarily. There is evidence, I think, of CD4 responses. And, and as you can see with the durability, I think there's evidence of, of memory. But to your point, I mean, we're continuing to look for durability, evidence of durability of protection. Um, and I, I think that's an, that's an open question. So I, I don't want to turn, I don't want to uh, stop prematurely the conversation and questions, but we are spilled over by about seven minutes. Does anybody else have any pressing questions that need to be asked at this time? Otherwise, we'll move forward. None? All right, Dr. Kohler. Um, so now we're going to uh, work group uh, interpretation and next steps. Dr. Choi. Okay. Um, uh, so thank you, Dr. Collar, for that presentation. Um, so um, our work group has met twice at this point. Um, at our last work group meeting, Dr. Collar uh, did give the work group a, a longer presentation of the presentation you saw today, about 30 minutes. Um, and we were able to start some initial discussions on um, our thoughts on that presentation. So these are just kind of the uh, initial uh, impressions um, from the work group. Um, just in general, uh, appears to be encouraging evidence for the effectiveness in the prevention of EVD um, when administered in the outbreak setting in a ring vaccination strategy. Um, there appears to be an acceptable safety profile. Um, the issue of the arthritis was definitely an, uh, something that was raised of concern by our work group members, given the, um, the population in which that we are making potentially policy recommendations for. And, um, you know, again, it, the arthritis was seen in mostly the European American studies, not so much in the um, studies in Africa, but again, that potentially could be due to, um, you know, um, the follow up um, that was done. Um, again, the other thing that we need to consider as a work group going forward in, in interpreting any of this data is the fact that there is no immune correlate for protection. Um, but as Dr. Collar noted, you know, IgG antibodies tend to persist um, after vaccination. Um, additional uh, points that the work group will be looking at and, and we'll be discussing and looking um, into more um, is the issue of this viral virus dissemination and replication, particularly in the skin vesicles and in the joints. And the fact that um, the phase one study um, showed that this can persist up to two to three weeks um, after vaccination. 
um, that there was evidence of seeding of the of the virus of the vaccine virus in the joints. Um, uh, based on detection in the synovial fluid, as well as replicating virus in, in the skin vesicles. Uh, and then, as Dr. Collar mentioned, um, that some of these, um, you know, events after vaccination appear to be almost like a, a mix, a chimeric uh, mix between the VSV um, backbone as well as the glycoprotein of the Ebola virus. Uh, and perhaps that is somehow um, related to the, uh, its role in the arthritis and arthralgia that's been noted. Uh, as far as next anticipated workgroup steps, um, continue to evaluate and discuss the safety data and immunogenicity data that was presented by uh, Mark uh, to start on the grade evaluation and the evidence to recommendations framework given um, this data and, you know, with our population in mind of the U.S. Um, pre-exposure scenario. Um, and then eventual presentation of policy options. Um, as uh, Dr. Culler mentioned, um, you know, they are expected to hear from the FDA sometime in March, um, you know, um, but potentially it could happen earlier. Um, so um, we're at this point, we're working towards um, do doing this review and getting the work done in anticipation of the February ACIP meeting in the event that the vice vaccine is licensed at that time. Um, if not, then we will have to look at other options. Thank you. Questions? So Go ahead. I, I don't know if this will be helpful for the committee at all to hear it directly from the FDA, but we're, we're well aware of the need that licensing this vaccine would, would fill. We're diligently working on completing our thorough review and arriving at a licensing decision uh, ahead of the, well ahead of the March uh, action date. Thank you for that clarification. Dr. Lee. So I, I just want to clarify what the policy option might be, and I might have missed it, so I apologize. But um, there was the, um, is it as you're uh, implying, which is focused on the healthcare worker recommendation, or is it um, sort of in line with the, the way the indication's going for FDA approval? Which I realize it's a component of that, but I just didn't know what we were looking at. I'm sorry, are you, talking, are you talking about in terms of what the work group is looking at? Yes, I'm, uh, there's on, uh, in the Merck presentation, there's an initial indication sought uh, for that particular population, adults 18 years of age and older in reactive use settings, of which I'm assuming this is part of the reactive use setting, but I just want to clarify yeah, what the policy options. Thank you, I mean, I think that there are larger issues, but the urgency I think CDC feels is the smaller population that Dr. Troy was trying to describe who are laboratorians in the US, folks that work in these healthcare facilities that may be asked to take care of Ebola patients, given that we've already seen healthcare worker cases, and folks traveling overseas to respond to those outbreaks. So the urgency is a, a narrower group than the indication. Yes, yes, exactly. And that is why we, we talked about the phases in the beginning, um, you know, our, you know, Initially, you know, we should look at children. We should look at pregnant people. You know, but the initial the initial push at this moment, based on um, the outbreak, the current outbreak in DRC, um, and what Merck is seeking licensure for, our priority is to make uh, make some um, rec uh, uh, recommendations to policy in terms of very specific populations, and then continuing that work in the second phase of the of the work group. And then maybe just to clarify, I just want to confirm, um, will we see uh, for the various groupings of laboratory workers what the potential risk might be? Because it was just hard for me to tell because it seemed like there were several groups in there. So, yeah, just to, to clarify, so we're, we're talking about people who are at least 18 years old, non-pregnant, non-lactating females, and non-immunocompromised hosts. And it's for, as um, Dr. Messonnier uh, mentioned, um, the, uh, the people who are at risk in the United States for either working in the labs or uh, volunteering or working overseas or whatever, we are going to talk about if there is whether or not, you know, different risks for different people. And if we, uh, depending on what we decide, we will be presenting that risk category, uh, different risk categories. We, we just haven't had that conversation yet. We only met twice. Yeah, and um, a lot of the stuff that we're learning, for example, we just heard the Merck presentation uh, on Friday. 
So we're just really opening the doors right now, but we, we hope to discuss in detail those things. Yeah, and just to tack on to that, you know, in choosing our work group members, we also had this uh, issue in mind as well. And so we have invited people from, you know, like MSF, um, who's uh, obviously regularly sends healthcare workers to EVD outbreaks, as well as um, people from the laboratory network, um, the, the BL cell 4 labs as well. So to help inform our decisions. Dr. Messonnier. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, I just want to say that this is a really complicated issue. You know, we value highly being able to rapidly ask ACIP for difficult policy questions to come to a rapid conclusion and make a rapid recommendation if it's possible. But if it's not, we understand we just need to be transparent about why we can't get to a resolution. And I would say that it, one thing that I heard loud and clear is that for the ACIP, it's not just about the immunogenicity and safety. There are a variety of practical implementation issues that need to be worked out before you make a recommendation in terms of what the specific risk groups are, how it impacts your family members, you know, what about sexual partners and um, questions about actually how you access the vaccine. And so a recommendation won't just be yes or no. It's got to include all the rest of the things that we normally um, pay attention to. And if we can't get that together to your satisfaction, then you won't be ready to vote. You know, I, oh, sorry. Can I? I was going to say, Dr. Fry, you look like you're Thank winding you. up for a question. Sorry about that. Uh, I apologize. Okay, uh, so I would just like to say that um, to give you some reassurance that the, the, the committee is fully aware of the ask and that we are working very hard to, to meet the February date to provide this information. So we'll see. Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Dr. Choi, for that presentation. Uh, we will move on now to vaccine safety uh, with Dr. DiStefano. Well, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to update uh, the committee and provide an overview of the work over the Immunization Safety Office and then how we monitor and evaluate the uh, safety of vaccines. Uh, so I'll just uh, be uh, initially provide a fairly high level overview of the vaccine safety monitoring systems that we use in our office. Then I'll use a uh, uh, the example of HPV vaccine to provide more detail about how we uh, actually do that. And then just finish uh, at the end touching a little bit on uh, broader national and international vaccine safety monitoring and research efforts. So just want to emphasize that vaccine safety is a major consideration in all phases of the vaccine life cycle from initial vaccine development through the pre-licensure studies and clinical trials and, and through the end of and eventually after licensure. And it's uh, after licensure that the, our work comes in, along with uh, we work closely with FDA. Now, I'll be uh, focusing on uh, our office, the Immunization Safety Office, but uh, we have to acknowledge there are several other agencies in the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as other governmental agencies and organizations, as well as organizations outside government, including the uh, vaccine manufacturers who are involved in the uh, vaccine safety enterprise. So our office it really uses three main systems to uh, monitor and evaluate vaccine safety. Uh, I'll be describing each of these in more detail. But I uh, also want to emphasize that probably a fourth major function in our office is cross-cutting and uh, do quite a bit of communication and response to inquiries from the public, uh, physicians, and others. So I'll begin with uh, our VAR system. This is a spontaneous reporting system or passive surveillance system, if you will. And we co-manage this with the uh, FDA. Uh, it has a standard reporting form, and anyone can submit a form. It could be from a healthcare provider, a 
patient or a parent or someone else. Uh, this just shows a, an example of the uh, PDF writable form and uh, indicates that uh, some of the main types of information we get on uh, describing the patient, demographics, and uh, the vaccination provider. Uh, information on the vaccines and then a uh, sort of a free text description of the adverse events. Uh, this is just a uh, picture here of the other main uh, mechanism for reporting. This is an online form. It has the same fields as the PDF form and uh, this is uh, really our preferred mechanism and I'm happy to report that well over half of the uh, reports that are uh, filed currently are online. So very high level statistics, just to put the uh, number of uh, reports that we receive in VAERS in context of the number of vaccine doses distributed. Um, we receive about 30,000 uh, or actually up almost to 50,000 nowadays uh, reports. Uh, here we do, I've divided them up into uh, influenza vaccine and non-influenza vaccine because uh, one, the influenza vaccine is by far the uh, most common vaccine that's uh, administered. And there's also differences in age. The influenza vaccine has more older people, whereas the non-flu vaccines are, are predominant or have a higher proportion of infants and children. But as you see, if you take the uh, non-influenza vaccines, we've had about close to 30,000 reports that were submitted in 2017, but that's out of 164 million of vaccine doses that were distributed. And similarly for the uh, flu vaccines in the 2018-19 season, there were 159 million doses distributed, among which we received just over 11,000 reports to VAERS. So the methods we use to uh, to uh, evaluate and uh, analyze the VAERS reports. There are a variety of them. Uh, first, uh, the first step is the uh, reports, particularly the uh, symptoms and conditions reported, are coded using a standardized coding system known as MEDRA. Uh, for certain types of reports, these include serious reports, which is a regulatory definition provided below, as well as for some selected conditions of special interest, depending on the vaccine. We do more in-depth review beyond the, uh, uh, the, the in, in individual reports. We intent, attempt to obtain medical records and, and other supporting uh, documentation uh, to review those reports. Uh, then we also uh, conduct trends and patterns of reporting. If, uh, if we know the number of doses that have been distributed for a vaccine or actual n number of va people vaccinated, we can uh, calculate reporting rates. And then for, to make sure sort of um, we haven't missed anything, we conduct a, a data mining analysis, which is called empirical Bayesian data mining. Um, to look for disproportional reporting, and I'll be saying a little bit more about that shortly. So I think you've seen this uh, slide before. Those of you who have been on the committee for a while have probably seen it several times. As a spontaneous reporting system, uh, the VAERS has certain strengths and limitations. You certainly have to be aware of what purposes it can be used for and also its limitations. Its main strengths are that it's uh, national in scope and thus can rapidly detect safety signals. But due to the various limitations of uh, passive reporting, uh, VAERS reports generally cannot be used to assess causality. So it's primarily a hypothesis generating system. So if VAERS identifies a potential vaccine safety concern, these usually have to be followed up in more robust uh, studies or data systems. In, the, uh, in our office, our main system we rely on to conduct population-based uh, surveillance and epidemiologic research is the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. Currently, there are eight participating integrated health organizations. They are shown on this map. 
VSD was established in 1990. It uh, currently uh, covers medical care and uh, demographic data on over 12 million persons per year. And and it links, uses uh, the infrastructure of the participating healthcare organizations beginning with their computerized databases to conduct initial analyses. Uh, key to that are the computerized immunization registries. Or, uh, and, the, and we have um, personal uh, linked study IDs. These are de-identified study IDs that we can link an individual's immunization records with various types of uh, other computerized data, including diagnoses from outpatient emergency room and hospital discharges, and we also have access to other types of information as needed. Importantly, we also have access to uh, individual medical records. That's important because we often uh, have to go from the uh, computerized codes to uh, to do further validation of our findings in terms of validating the diagnoses or obtaining additional clinical details. So VSD covers all the uh, members of the uh, participating uh, healthcare organizations. So as such, we have information on both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Uh, we know the times when they were vaccinated and are able to do follow-up studies as well. So we have the data to do traditional epidemiologic studies, such as descriptive analyses, cohort and case control studies. More recently, uh, we've been employing some self-control methods as well. We are also uh, beginning to explore uh, some data mining techniques. Uh, and uh, really one of the main innovations uh, of VSD in recent years, particularly for real-time surveillance, is uh, rapid cycle analysis, or RCA. So RCA is a uh, surveillance tool. As I said, it provides us the ability to conduct near real-time vaccine safety monitoring. It uses uh, sequential statistical um, monitoring techniques. Uh, again, it, it employs the automated analyses, that is the ICD coded diagnoses from administrative data, which are tend to be um, refreshed weekly. So we can conduct analysis sometimes weekly, depending on vaccine, it may be monthly. Uh, the system is designed to detect statistical signals. Uh, when a statistical signal occurs, that just indicates that there may be an association that we have to uh, dig into further. And we do conduct additional evaluation, sometimes launching a more traditional epidemiologic studies. And chart confirmation is usually key to this uh, further evaluation. Uh, again, just to emphasize, not all the statistical signals represent a true increase in risk for an adverse event. Our third main project in the office is the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, or CISA. Uh, this involves uh, the participation of seven medical research centers that are listed on the slide. Uh, CISA provides us access to uh, vaccine safety experts, as well as uh, experts in um, several other clinical disciplines. And it has two main uh, purposes. Uh, well, his first purpose is to assist U.S. healthcare providers with complex vaccine safety questions about their patients. And uh, there's a link provided on this uh, slide as to um, how providers can ask to refer a patient for a CISA evaluation. The other main function of CISA is to conduct clinical research. These tend to be studies of specific vaccine safety questions. It, tend to be studies that require in-person interaction with the study subjects, sometimes involving a collection of laboratory specimens, and often these are uh, randomized. So I'm going to present uh, an example of how we conduct uh, these various uh, monitoring and uh, research activities. I'm going to use the HPV vaccine as an example. Uh, HPV 
vaccine has a well-established safety record, and I don't intend this afternoon to provide a comprehensive review of all the evidence uh, to support that safety record. This is primarily of using this vaccine to illustrate some of our processes and methods. So this is a timeline of uh, some of the, the monitoring and uh, research that we've uh, conducted of, of the HPV vaccine safety monitoring. The top bars are more the surveillance type activities uh, using VAERS and uh, VSD rapid cycle analysis. As you'll see soon after licensure of the uh, four-valent HPV vaccine, we launched uh, VAERS monitoring as well as VSD rapid cycle analyses. Over time, we've periodically updated uh, the VAERS monitoring. And then uh, with the um, introduction of uh, the nine-valent HPV vaccine, uh, we've reinitiated uh, uh, both efforts in, in monitoring the safety uh, of that uh, different or expanded uh, formulation vaccine. Uh, we've published the uh, findings of, of the uh, VAERS monitoring as well as the VSD rapid cycle analyses, and these studies are listed below. And uh, in addition to the surveillance studies, we also do conduct uh, focus studies of specific uh, vaccine safety questions or uh, conditions, and uh, some of the selected uh, studies that we've done, have done and uh, publications are listed on the uh, lower part of this graph. So in terms of the initial monitoring or surveillance, I'm going to use the, uh, more, the more recently updated uh, uh, HPV vaccine, the nine-valent vaccine, as an example. Uh, from VAERS, this is a fairly typical table that we generate from the VAERS reports. Uh, you see this is the data we had um, on the nine-valent vaccine from December 2014 to December 2017. Uh, just highlight a few of the numbers. First of all, we divide up the uh, reports into serious and non-serious, and you'll see the vast majority of the submitted reports uh, were non-serious. Also, uh, of the leading uh, symptoms that were reported, these tend to be uh, local uh, reactions or, or um, systemic reactions. I want to uh, focus a little bit on what this percentage means, because sometimes there's confusion about what the percentage in these tables means. Let's uh, take uh, syncope, the 488 syncope reports, and that percentage of 7%. Now, that 7% is not, does not mean that 7% of people who are, receive HPV vaccine had syncope. It just, it just is a, a proportion of what that 488 uh, reports of syncope is out of the 7,058 uh, re reports filed, uh, non-serious reports filed in VAERS for that vaccine. Uh, it's important to keep this proportion in mind because it's also what, uh, what we mean when we talk about disproportionality. So we discuss disproportionality, we're meaning for this specific vaccine, for instance, with syncope, is that 7%? higher than the proportion in other vaccines. So that, that gets us to VAERS empirical data mining. Again, this uh, is a sophisticated uh, statistical method that can, can conduct disproportional reporting analyses. It really analyzes thousands of, uh, of MEDRA preferred terms to look at po for possible associations. And then the um, nine-valent HPV uh, Bayes, Bayesian uh, data mining, disproportional reporting was identified for syn syncope. This was not considered a, syn a signal because syncope was also disproportionately reported for uh, four-valent HPV, and syncope is a known and labeled as adverse event for any injectable vaccine. Other preferred terms signaled, but they did not represent an adverse event. It represented administration errors, such as administration to a patient of inappropriate age. There were no other disproportional reporting findings for um, nine-valent HPV. 
So in summary, the VAERS review, uh, VAERS received over 7,000 reports following nine valent HPV. Most reports were non-serious. This should be taken in context of it. This was a time period when about 29 million nivalent HPV doses were distributed in the United States. No new safety signals or unexpected patterns were observed. And the conclusion was that the safety profile of nivalent HPV is consistent with data from pre-licensure trials and post-licensure trial on the four-valent vaccine. We also conducted RCA analysis of the nine-valent HPV. This was a prospective cohort design. The surveillance period was from 2015 to 2017. And in, the study included males and females nine to 26 years of age. Right, rapid cycle analysis is not a data mining uh, technique. Uh, it requires pre-specifying in advance so select number of uh, conditions that will be monitored. Uh, that selection is made based on findings from uh, pre-licensure studies, from similar vaccines, from reports in the literature, et cetera. This uh, slide lists the, pre, um, the uh, conditions that were monitored in the RCA. Uh, depending on condition, we might have used data from various uh, clinical settings, from outpatient emergency department or inpatient. Importantly for these uh, analyses, we have to dis define a risk interval, and that's basically depending on the uh, adverse event, what we would consider a biologically plausible interval for a uh, possible uh, condition to be related to vaccination. And also we have to have a comparison group in which uh, we determine if uh, there may be increased reporting and depending on the vaccine and such, that uh, comparison group uh, may, may vary. So the summary of the findings from the VSD RCA was that statistical signals did occur for several adverse events. As with VAERS, syncope was also identified uh, in the VAERS and the VSD RCA as was injection site reactions, but these were known expect and expected reactions. All other signals that included those listed in the next bullet were further investigated. So they had an uh, allergic reaction, pancreatitis, and appendicitis had signals in at least some of the subgroups that were uh, analyzed. But on further review, these uh, signals were not, uh, these statistical signals were not confirmed. That is primarily when we went to the medical records, the diagnosis was not verified. It was determined that this was a rule out diagnosis or it was not an incident event. So that's how we conduct sort of the, 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 the initial surveillance type aspects of, of our monitoring. As I mentioned, we also conduct specific uh, studies of certain conditions or specific safety questions. Uh, several of those were um, listed on, as part of the uh, timeline that I presented earlier. I just want to go through an example here of one such condition. Uh, this will be uh, death, uh, death uh, related to HPV vaccine. The uh, re reason I focus on this is because it's the most concerning adverse event. And also I want to touch a bit on this because it, there's a frequent misconception particularly with the VAERS reports that uh, the death reports in VAERS that the, the death reports represent causal associations. Whereas I've tried to emphasize a report filed to VAERS does not signify that the vaccine was the cause. A VAERS report only indicates a temporal relationship that an adverse event occurred sometime after a vaccination. So to... Uh, to do a more, we did an evaluation uh, of the VAERS reports initially to see uh, what we could discern from those reports. Uh, during a surveillance period of January 2009 to December 2015, there were 29 reports of death uh, submitted to VAERS. Uh, 61 of these were hearsay reports 
That is, there was no, the person reported did not have direct information, so no medical information could be verified. An example of a hearsay report would be some reports that were submitted of a person saw some mention of a death in social media. Uh, we had two reports that mentioned the cause of death, but no patient or contact information was provided, so we could not get back to get additional information. In the end, we were able to obtain uh, additional follow-up and verify 29 of the reports. The VAERS review of these confirmed death reports found no pattern with respect to time after vaccination, combination of vaccine administered, or importantly, the diagnoses of death or a heterogeneous uh, uh, group of um, of causes of death. So the interpretation was that the VAERS data did not suggest a, a possible causal association uh, with vaccination. To look at this in a more uh, systematic uh, fashion, more systematic epidemiologically, uh, we also conducted a study uh, in the Vaccine Safety Data Link. Uh, this was uh, done covering the years 2005 to 2011 and included individuals 9 to 26 years of age. Uh, we identified potential deaths and obtained medical records and coroner's reports to uh, uh, verify those deaths and identify causes of death. In the end, 13 deaths were identified within 0 to 30 days following the four-valent HPV vaccine. Of these, nine were due, due to external causes such as injuries, two were definitely unrelated to vaccination, and two, there was not sufficient evidence to confirm or rule out a causal association. Take the, with these 13 deaths and the number of uh, four-valent HPV vaccines that had been administered in VSD, we estimated that the, uh, the rate of uh, mortality within 30 days uh, was about 11, 12 deaths per 100,000 person years. We compared this with uh, U.S. vital statistics data for a similar age group. And again, according to those data, the uh, death rate is, would, should be about 68 almost deaths per 100,000 persons per year. So a substantially lower death rate was found in VSD following four-valent HPV vaccine. And we think that's Probably a large part of that is that healthy vaccinee effect. Um, we were expecting this when we went in, so our primary analysis was really uh, an analysis in which we focused on um, vaccinated individuals only, use this case center design to look at vaccinated uh, people and to, d to see if the date of vaccination uh, was somehow related. Um, to the outcome of death in this case. That is, was there an increased risk within 30 days of vaccination compared with more distant time periods? And what we found was the risk of death was not increased during the 30 days following vaccination. So a summary, the VAERS and VSD findings on HPV vaccine. We did a detect uh, expected uh, uh, associations with uh, outcomes such as low injection site reactions and syncope, but no new safety concerns were identified in VAERS monitoring or VSD-RCA. The epidemiologic studies that we conducted in VSD found no increased risk for a variety of different health conditions as listed on the slide. So we, we do still have a few studies in progress in VSD on POTS, CRPS, and chronic fatigue syndrome. As there, that's because the evidence on these has, has come primarily from case reports and case series and expert reviews. Uh, most of the, those reviews by experts and specialty societies have concluded that there is not evidence to suggest a causal association with these conditions, but these are conditions heterogeneous, they may have a variable a symptomatology, they've been difficult for us to, uh, to work out algorithms uh, to identify uh, through the automated data. So what we have going on right now are just some feasibility studies to even see if we can identify these uh, 
uh, reliably identify these conditions in VSD to be able to, to study them and, and get some epidemiologic measures. So I focused uh, on our office, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, our, we do not work in isolation. I show in the United States there are several other agencies and organizations that work in vaccine safety, and this is also true internationally. In recent years, there's been an increasing focus on vaccine safety, and uh, this, uh, this slide just shows the increasing number of uh, uh, publications related to vaccine safety. The bars are the annual number of uh, vaccine safety related publications. And I'll just emphasize that uh, the scale is uh, logarithmic on this, uh, on this chart. So the, uh, the number of, uh, of publications has really been exponential. And international studies have also played an important role in evaluating the safety of HPV vaccine. Uh, this slide just uh, presents some of the selected epidemiologic studies that have been published on these variety of uh, conditions uh, that have been suggested at one point or another to possibly re be related to HPV vaccination. Some of these uh, I've mentioned because they were and conducted in VSD, but uh, several of the, uh, the key studies come from Europe, particularly the uh, national registries and healthcare databases of countries such as Denmark and Sweden, as well as large healthcare databases uh, from England and France. None of these studies found increased risk uh, related to any of the HPV vaccines and, and any of these conditions studied. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to emphasize that pre licensure activities form the foundation of vaccine safety. I hope I've uh, demonstrated that the U.S. is a comprehensive, robust vaccine safety monitoring system. And we believe that the existence of uh, such a system uh, helps to maintain public confidence in vaccines. But we also recognize that science is not sufficient in maintaining acceptance of vaccines. There's important work to be done in terms of communication, policy, and other factors. And I'll just close by mentioning that uh, CDC is uh, just beginning a new strategic framework that is, be is known as Vaccinate with Confidence, with the goal of strengthening vaccine confidence and preventing outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases in the United States. I think you'll be hearing more about this framework tomorrow morning. I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of these individuals in helping me put together this uh, presentation as well as all the work of the staff of the Immunization Safety Office and all our colleagues in the VSD, VAERS, and CESA projects. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Stefano. Any questions from the, from the committee? From the liaison groups? Okay. Thank you again, and um, I think we, we can now adjourn. Are there any other comments? All right, this meeting is adjourned. We will begin tomorrow at 8 a.m.